Okay, wonderful. So without, any, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our Director of Development, Robert Fleming, to say a few words before we start. Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to welcome you here today for the launch of the Kaleidoscope Alumni Network. A special welcome to all those who are joining online. I hope the technology is working for you. For those who don't know me already, my name is Robert Fleming. I'm the Director of Development at the University of St Andrews. First of all, a huge thanks to Dr. Catherine Dunford, who you've just heard introduce me, um, for pulling today's programme together. It's been a long time coming. Development is responsible for developing and strengthening the university's relationship with alumni, friends and benefactors worldwide, and for the university's philanthropic <laughs> fundraising. Our aim is to encourage and facilitate continuing engagement with and investment in the life of the university amongst its loyal supporters. We're delighted to welcome you to the Laidlaw Music Centre, to this state-of-the-art Macpherson Recital Room. This building was originally due to open in April 2020, but delayed for two years due to lockdown. It feels fitting that today we're launching our new alumni network here, because it is also new and also feels overdue. The Kaleidoscope Alumni Network is a network that champions the ethnic and cultural diversity of St Andrews graduates around the world. It, it, it demonstrates our determination to grow our wider St Andrews community intentionally and our programme today reflects this. We're starting with a panel that draws directly from our bubble in St Andrews but also from a further field in the university sector. This will be followed by a conversation between two incredibly talented musicians one a student and one an alumnus. After lunch, we'll be hearing from our keynote speaker about how we can nurture reflexivity and wisdom in higher education. And then later this evening, we'll be listening to an alumna who has spent her life and career representing those who need support to have their voices heard. So let's get started. I'm going to pass over to Dr. Rebecca Widderfield, Vice Principal <coughs> Peel University, who will chair the first session. Rebecca, thank you. Thanks very much, Robert, and uh, welcome everyone to, to today's launch of the Kaleidoscope Network and today's panel discussion. We need new words, the power and pitfalls of language in discussing diversity. We underestimate the power of language at our peril. The novelist Angela Carter said, language is power, life, and the instrument of culture, the instrument of domination and liberation. So a fascinating topic, I think, for the launch of, launch of the network. I'll just briefly introduce the panel and then I'm going to ask them to say a few words about what language means to them and social identity and how it impacts upon the experience of the world. And then we'll launch into a broad discussion of some of the issues that that, that, that brings up. So on my left we have Dr. Gurnam Singh, who's a visiting fellow in race and education, the University of, an honorary associate at the University of Warwick, and, and lots of other things besides, but the, the short, shorthand for Gurnham is he's an activist researcher, writer and, and educator, has been both in practice and, and in academia, and his work is dedicated to highlighting and disrupting systems and mechanisms of power, privilege and violence that lead to human suffering and in, inequity. Written lots and lots, and I'm sure he'll, he'll say more about that when he speaks. Uh, next to Gurnham is uh, Divine Mwaswa Mwasi, who's a third year medical student at the University of St Andrews and also president of the African Caribbean Society and this is passionate about equity, diversity and, and inclusion. Uh, <coughs> next to Divine is uh, Akira O'Connor, who's a senior lecturer in psychology and neuroscience here at the university and also chair of the Race Equality Charter, uh, a, fant a really important initiative for the, for the university. Um, his research and teaching interests include the role of scientific racism in shaping modern approaches of psychological research. So obviously very important perspectives to bring to this panel discussion. And then joining us on screen, I hope at some, at some point soon, is, is uh, Wei Lin, who's uh, Assistant Director of Admissions at the University of St Andrews. And she's been responsible for student recruitment activity and, and stakeholder engagement. So a very varied panel, people working in practice and in policy and, and in academia. But I wonder if we could just kick off by asking each of you just to say a few words about what language, is, language means to you in terms of your social identity and how it impacts upon your experience in the world. Maybe Gurnham, you could yeah. kick us off. 
I think it's kind of everything really. I mean, I can't imagine my sense of being without thinking about all the different kind of languages that I have had to encounter and I've encountered, claimed and reclaimed. Um, I'm a Yorkshireman, so you probably can tell from the accent, which itself is quite interesting, because when, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I went to London to the university there as an 18 year old with a turban, brown skin, and a Yorkshire accent. And all these kids from kind of, you know, home counties, from privileged kind of white backgrounds, just couldn't place me. They thought, what's this Yorkshireman doing with a turban? So there was this sense that for them, they probably had a very kind of singular view of what language is and then something that's kind of outside that. For me, it was never that, that the case, you know. So being bilingual, being able to speak three languages, seems inadequate for me, whereas a lot of my English friends, you know, speak in English. So that got me thinking about language is resistance, but also language is dominance, yeah? So if it's a dominating language, then you don't need to use anything else. I could say one more thing. I don't know if other people, but it, it, there's something about how language, having a different language gives you space, gives you a space to be able to think differently and talk differently and communicate. And at school, we had this language called, we call it AG language. It was made up. And so it was kind of like a playground language. I don't know if you had that as well. We call it AG language. You, and the teachers didn't know what we were talking about, but we were, we were communicating. So what it realized is that actually, you know, we are kind of, if, we, if what makes us human is the capacity to assimilate and to learn uh, and to develop language. So to take that away from us is, a, is an act of dehumanization. <laughs> Looks like I really need this rest day. Okay, back at it. I'm sure you, I'm sure you were enjoying that much more. <laughs> okay. So, so I just, just, I'll just finish on that. So, so for me, I cannot imagine my existence without language, yeah? But I also realise that language is something to be struggled for and struggled over. And just last thing, Professor Stuart Hall, uh, you know, kind of one of the heroes of mine, he said something, because there's lots of things about war culture, about political correctness, and Stuart said, he said, oppressed people have fought to, to create language, to claim a language, a language that can articulate their experience, and that we shouldn't deny the importance of that. And, and to take that away from them is to take away their experience. And you know, as a social worker, when I first came into social work in the 80s, there was no language for child sexual abuse. Nobody was talking about it. Did it exist? Obviously it did, but then you had to create a language that people could then talk about that. So language is important for a whole set of reasons that we don't even realise sometimes. Thank you very much, Gurnam, and apologies for that uh, uh, musical No, 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 that was, that was beautiful. I arranged that, deliberately arranged that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Shivani? I can very much relate uh, to what Gurnam was saying here, but I think something I'd like to add is I think language also influences how we think about ourselves. So, for example, in English, there are a lot of words or a lot of labels that are attached to people with skin that looks like mine. And if you've lived in a predominantly um, English-speaking space, for example, those words might then affect how you see yourself. But also, I think language is a very important thing for building connections. So I get extremely excited every single time I meet someone who speaks Swahili like me. And the connection from, oh my goodness, you can speak Swahili as well, is so beautiful that in sharing a language, we can share a connection. And I think a big part of the human experience is making connections with different people. And language is a tool that allows us to do that. It allows us to express ourselves, to say what we want to say about the world, to see the world in different ways. And definitely when you speak, different languages you realize that in language itself there are nuances about the world so for example in swahili you cannot say that um the woman married the man you have to say that the man married the woman and that's because in that society there's the idea of the man is the head of the home and the language therefore reflects that and a lot of languages reflect what we see in society so for example um, you're from Kenya, but you speak English very well. Simply that is, you can see from the word but, is an idea that people have that is reflected in the way that they speak. So for me, I think language is a tool of identity, a tool of connection, 
um, and just a way to see the world in different ways and through different lenses just by what language you're speaking at the time. And also, I really like to read and I really love poetry and music and I think language allows us to do a beautiful thing which is make art. And we're going to have some of that to, after, after this session. Uh, thanks to mine. Akira. Yeah, so, I mean, just building on some of the themes that have been uh, spoken about already, what I want to touch on is, is the kind of dynamic, ever-changing nature of language uh, as it relates to my, my personal identity. So, um, I'm, I am mixed race, I'm half Japanese, half Irish, grew up in London, and I went to Japanese school um, on Saturdays in London, which, which was, you know, it, I, it wasn't much fun, mainly because of how I was spoken about at school which is, in, in Japanese, there's, there's a term for people like me. It's hafu. Um, that's a Japanization of the, the English word half. Right? And it's, it's a derogatory term. It's, it's a, a term that has all <coughs> sorts of negative associations. Unless you're, you're on t TV as a hafu TV celebrity, then, then it, it's, it's a pretty bad thing to be labeled with. So, so I kind of railed against that. I felt pushed out by... Um, by that system of education. And then over the years, I've, I've kind of held that identity as, as, as something that I can use to identify myself with, um, but never in any particular kind of warm way until I saw, I started seeing uh, a few years ago that this word was being reclaimed by people like me as, as uh, a, a category within which people could talk about their experiences and in so doing kind of build a positive association with, with that word hafu. And so now I, I have far fewer hesitations in talking about myself as someone who is hafu when I'm speaking with, with Japanese people because there is also this, this, this kind of positive set of associations uh, in, to do with kind of reclaiming language, to do with um, understanding that, that you, can, you can kind of build, build positives out of what might originally be, be kind of negative uh, linguistic kind of associations. So, so that's uh, hopefully a kind of illustration of, 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 of the ways in which people can kind of repurpose language, even if it starts out as, as bad, as, as, as a, a, kind of, a, a kind of nucleus around which to coalesce and build a positive identity. Thanks very much, Kieran. That's certainly something we saw in the, with, the, uh, the, with the gay movement and the um, appropriation of the word queer was very much actually taking that term, which had been a term of abuse, and repurposing it to use, to use your terms. We're now going to try the technology. And Waylin, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes? Uh, we can't hear you. Let's get some reflections from Waylin. Hello, Waylin. I don't, I don't know if that's deafening you as much as it's deafening us. Can you can you hear us, Waylin? I can hear you well. We're just getting a bit of feedback, but if you if you wouldn't mind just giving us some reflections, and hopefully we'll be able to address that while you talk. And I hope it's not too. Um, disorienting for you as well. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, it was nice to connect with you. Um, I'm in China, so greeting from China. I'm on the university business trip here. Is the sound okay over there? It's great, thank you. Okay, perfect. And I would like to apologize that due to the IT uh, difficulties, so I wasn't able to connect with you previously, but um, I heard some of the key speakers and also led by Rebecca on today's session. So what a language means to me, I think that as a Chinese coming to the UK as a St. Andrews graduate, and then now as a member of staff, I feel a language serves as a tool for me. It helps me to express myself freely from my thoughts, from the work that I am doing, 
the research that I am doing as well as expressing my emotions in different kind of um, settings. It is also a tool for me to learn new skills from colleagues, peers, and other professionals to understand their culture, to understand their language, and then to understand what's new happening around us. So language serves a tour for me. However, I think that language is more than a tour. It is connecting from you and another person, you with a project, you with an organization. Coming as a Chinese, English is not my first language. So I did felt that it was a challenge for me when I first landed in the UK. But getting to know the local community, getting to know students, colleagues, members of staff, helping me to integrate into the local community, definitely language serves as a bridge. So I really benefit of learning a language, English, in this content, as well as connecting with the peers, with the local community. So that's the language means to me. Thank you very much, Waylon, and the sounds now now fine for everybody. So I think we've, there are quite a number of common themes there. So more positively, we've got language as a mechanism for building kind of connections, for identity, for self-expression, for a way, as Waylon was saying, of making sense of the world. Uh, conversely, more negative connotations in terms of language as a mechanism for conveying structural inequalities, as a, as a, as a, as a mechanism of abuse and domination. Um, but Akira spoke about the sort of repurposing, and, and Akira, you talked about the, the, the importance of language and categorization as, as about the way we talk about experiences. And I wonder if you could sort of maybe say a little bit more about how do we sort of bridge that sort of walk that sort of line, if you like, between language as a source of solidarity and bringing collective action and identity and, and language, particularly categorization, as a source of othering. How do we sort of walk that, that sort of rather tricky line? Yeah, I, 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 that, yeah, it is a tricky line. I, I think there's, that, there's an important um, component of, of culture that, that needs to be brought into language in order for it to become um, to, to, to become positive. Um, I think when you, when you just use categories as a way of, um, a, a, as a way of subdividing people and, and uh, describing uh, surface level characteristics of people, um, that, that leaves a lot of negative space into which the, the kind of the dominant culture, typically the culture that is doing the categorizing, um, can can kind of uh, put its it, its own read on on what makes these people different or those people different uh, from from the dominant uh, the dominant cultural position. I think as soon as you you allow that negative space to be filled with um, with, with representations of culture from the people themselves who are being categorized, which, which is exactly kind of what, what happened in, in kind of my own experience of, of the way in which hafu, that word, was kind of repurposed to represent a set of common experiences rather than just what makes you different from, from us, the, the dominant culture. As soon as you, you allow for that kind of self-determination, I think you get a much kind of richer idea of, of um, what, what that, those words, those categorizations might mean and, and, and the, the kind of, you, you probably also get much more of an affinity towards those categories from, from the people who, who are being described and, and previously othered themselves. So uh, maybe that's a starting point to an answer. And, and Gerd, yeah. you've written quite extensively about I think, this. I mean, I think I'd like to talk about othering with a small O and othering with a big O, yeah? Just to make the distinction between the two. I think, I think we can agree that naturally we need, as human beings, we identify similarity and difference, yeah? In the sense, what makes us human is the fact that we are all human beings. We all identify as part of the same species, I think. Uh, but also the fact that we all see ourselves as different. And I sometimes say that, you know, heaven, 
And it, you know, if you were, is, is a place where everybody looks alike, is that heaven or hell? It's probably hellish, isn't it? So, so that means that heaven must be a place where everybody is kind of diverse. So in some senses, there's a tension between diversity and, and sameness. So we, we struggle with that. But the small O of othering is where we contrast each other. And, and that's, that's good. That's, there might be some biological kind of scientific kind of things there. The problem is with, with the big O, the othering as categorizing others. And Galtry Spivak talks about that in her work. She says that this is a form of epistemic violence. Yeah? She says this is, this is epistemic violence. And um, it actually has quite, quite kind of clear historical kind of roots. It emerges out of, to some extent, the, the development of the nation state and the colonial state, and, 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 and particularly the Western concept. Um, um, you know, we know that one of the one of the things about nation states is that it needs to keep records and, and so things like population statistics, you know, censuses as a, is one of the ways in which we categorise people. Formally, they're about 120 years old. We ne never had censuses. Uh, counting and categorising, say in India, the different people of different caste groups was formalised by the British. Yeah, and then they use those categories to do all kinds of manipulations. So the category of the Sikhs is the warrior people. So what do you do with the Sikhs? Send them out to fight. Your warriors go and fight for us in the Middle East. Uh, and the Brahmins, oh, you're the intellectuals. So you can be part of our uh, civil service. Yeah? So, so actually categorization becomes instrumentalized uh, in the way in which, and, and it's become, uh, becomes functional, but also it becomes kind of judgmental as well. Uh, and so that's the kind of othering with the big O. The thing with the othering is it's never equal. If we can other on a kind of equal part, and that's fine. But it's always in a kind of superior, inferior, yeah? So when we think about, I mean, this I would say it's work. You know, the, 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 the Oriental and the Occidental, the East and the West. The East is always, or the North and the South. The South is always as kind of dangerous, maybe as uh, irrational, as, you know, non-enlightened. And the same thing with, the, so this is where it becomes problematic. Uh, and so yes, we need to celebrate our identities, but not in ways that places us in, in some kind of hierarchy of worth, which is what racism is all about, which is what most oppressions are all about. When you were talking about the categorization there, it was reminding me of a quote by Desmond Tutu. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something around language is a mechanism for representing reality, but it also becomes a mechanism for creating reality. Um, and you, when you were talking about the Sikhs and Brahmins. Well, can I just come, come back with a quote here? This is a kind of dialogue with the <laughs> critical pedagogy. Um, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer in the dialectics of enlightenment, they're, kind of, they're reflecting on the way in which European enlightenment kind of culture and traditions and, and, and frameworks emerge. They said that one of it is categorization. They say categorization seems to be one thing that's characteristic of, of European enlightenment. They said, but they said categorization, uh, categories they call them, are a prerequisite for cognition. In a sense, you can't act unless you have a category to act on. But it says that uh, true cognition is when you realize the category isn't what it, 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 it matters. Yeah? So I've come to you know, St. Andrews. There's a category, St. Andrews University, top university in the country, etc., etc. But I don't really know anybody from St. Andrews until I kind of uh, take the label of St. Andrews and meet you as a person. Uh -huh. So it, I think we use categories and then we tear them up and burn them. You know, we use them for what purpose they serve, but they don't, they, they, we shouldn't use them absolutely. That's when it becomes dangerous. Thank you. Mm. Do you mind George coming? Yeah, so I think uh, what Renema said is uh, very true. We like little boxes for things. And the problem with that is then we'll assume maybe, oh, everyone who goes to St. Andrews acts like this. Everyone who comes from this part of the UK acts like this and I think that's where the problem is because I think there's even a lot of pride in I wouldn't say such categories but for example in Kenya we have very many tribal groups and they're diverse and they each have their own languages and their own cultures and their own modes of dressing and people love to celebrate that and love to celebrate where they're from and their category in that sense um, and even in, as an African woman, I love being an African woman. I love doing quote-unquote African things. 
and that's that's I think a good thing about <coughs> the categorization. That's the part where we can recognize what we are and we can celebrate it, but it should not influence then how we see everybody. Like when I see someone new and they're from St. Andrews, I shouldn't immediately put labels on them. I should allow myself to experience them and experience my time with them just as they are. Then I can decide for myself what I think of them. So I think the danger is in sticking labels to people and then expecting that they will respond to us or that we will experience them with that label stuck on them and then reacting badly when we don't or making them feel uncomfortable when they defy the expectations of the label we've placed on them. Thank you very much. And, and I want to bring Waylin in here because I'm thinking of categorization as well as quite a practical tool. So for example, I chair the Athena Swan, which is about tackling gender inequality. And one of the things we're doing at the moment is thinking about how do we disaggregate the data in order to be able to identify patterns and trends and identify where there are, are, are different outcomes and experiences for, for a particular, particular gender. And I was wondering, Waylin, if you could reflect maybe a little bit for us about your work in admissions, where I imagine categories are being used for, ostensibly for very positive purposes, for example, to ensure that we do have a, a more diverse student community. I wonder if you could tell us about some of the challenges and opportunities categorization provides in a practical sense in your work. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would like to give colleagues a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me well? We can hear you, Wade. Did, uh, did you hear my question there? Can you please repeat? Yes, of course. We were talking about um, categorization, and I was just uh, wondering if you could maybe reflect about how categorization is used in admissions. Um, you know, I, I, I was saying essentially for positive purposes to ensuring we have a diverse student community. And I guess some of the pros and cons you found, or the, the, the challenges and opportunities of using categorization in your work. Yeah, sure. I would like to give colleagues and also audience some data from admission. So last year in 2021, we received applications over 150 countries and territories in the world. And there are over 112 nationalities enrolled in St. Andrews study in our community. So I would like to let you know that the number demonstrates that how international, how diverse St. Andrews as a university is. So in admission, every year we receive a lot of applications everywhere in the world. We review the application holistically. We select the academic talented and the most suitable students for St. Andrews. We didn't just look at that the student who received A star, A star, A star. It's not just about the grades. It's about whether or not the student is suitable for St. Andrews, vice versa. In addition, we would like to make sure that the student that we recruited will feel St. Andrews is home for them. They can be pursuing their studies. They will be thrilled and they will be preparing themselves for a better future. So we hope that the students that we recruited into St. Andrews joining our community will bring their own culture, their language, their experiences to contribute to our St. Andrews University and the local community. Some of the challenges that you mentioned um, we are facing are we got so many excellent applications from everywhere in the world, but we only have very limited places for our students. So how can we select the most suitable one who can demonstrate their great interest in the subjects that they would like to pursue? So personal statement, teacher's reference, and also the academic transcript, et cetera, those are the ways that we assess the application. At the same time, we would like to um, 
focus on certain countries and regions that we can see a great potential and bringing those individuals to our community. For example, we can see there is an increasing interest from Africa, from Middle East. And of course, we are trying our very best to select the talented and suitable students to our community. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Waylin. And I think that sort of um, understanding of how categorization can be used as a, as a practical tool is, is really important. And I think what I'm picking up from the discussion is categorization as a starting point, but, but not, not an end in itself. I mean, one of the challenges we do know about categorization is it, it does have a tendency to ex obscure differential experiences, whether that's of racism or homophobia or, or, or whatever else, and, and maybe sort of obscure some of the intersectionality and the complexity of our humanity, if you want to put it in those terms. I wonder, Divine, would you want to have any reflections on, on that? Uh, yes, I could. Uh, so I think a starting point, we can talk about the term being black and minority ethnic. So while it's been a good thing in the sense that it has pushed forward a lot of, um, it's pushed forward a lot of things, a lot of conversations about racism and about the reality of racism and about systemic racism and about how institutions can make things better. But then it also kind of assumes that all black and minority ethnic people will experience racism the same way. So we will all experience racism, for example, that much is true. But the how we experience racism is different. So for example, like um, Akira said, for him, who's half Japanese and half Irish, maybe it was a feeling of, well, for the Irish people, they feel like your other, and the Japanese people also feel like your other. But I wouldn't experience racism like that because amongst the Canadian people, I don't feel other. But anywhere outside, I might feel that way. And for example, um, if you're a black person, and I think colorism now comes into this, the closer you are to whiteness, then the less racism you experience. The farther away you are from it, the more racism you experience. So that's also different. Or if you grow up in a predominantly white country, you will have habits or you will have experiences that might mean you experience less racism than somebody who, for example, has a very obvious non, let's say British or non-American accent. There will be things attached to that or attached to the fact that you did not grow up in that place, which is all racism again, but it's different. And then there's the nuances of, <coughs> okay, we're all black and minority ethnic people, but are you a woman or are you a man? Because then again, you experience um, the world differently because then you'll have all the problems of being a minority ethnic and all the problems of being a woman together. And it would be the same with all the other groups. And the more other boxes you tick, the more you'll experience the experiences of all those other people. And it sometimes can be difficult to place yourself because first their places will be perceived as only black or um, as a woman first. And so how do I figure out which identity is mine because they are both mine but there are spaces where i might feel like okay this is a space where i'm supposed to be only talking about blackness or only talking about womanhood and so i think that's where the problem with these categories is is if i cross multiple categories where do i then fit or if my experience is not talked about within this category then do i really belong to it anymore here, I could see you nodding quite a lot there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, that's a kind of textbook, textbook answer on, on the, the kind of the, the, the way in which language, the, the, these kind of straightforward ways of categorizing do, do obscure differences. I think uh, an important aspect of this as well is, is that um, we, we often view language as, as kind of value neutral in, in, in um, especially in science, when, when, we're, when we're using language to, to attempt to, to, um, to describe the work we're doing, we, we assume that it is kind of objective in, in its purpose. Um, 
often ignoring the, 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 the origins, uh, the sometimes kind of racist origins of the language that we are using. Um, because that's, that's not how we think about things now. So, for example, I'm, I'm talking kind of, I'm talking around about this. A very concrete example would be the origin of the statistics that we use um, in, so, let's say, in social sciences, um, where uh, statistics were developed with, with you, or the statistical tools we use were developed with eugenic origins. That is, um, attempting to uh, tell apart one group of people from another in order to determine which group of people is better, is cleverer, is, is more advanced, um, or is deficient. Um, and so that has baked itself into uh, the, the words that we still teach when we're teaching statistics in university, in this university now. Uh, when we talk about populations, when we talk about uh, samples, we're, we're using kind of biomedical, scientifically racist language uh, to describe our discipline. And so, the, the building on, on Divine's answer to, to the very first question, the, you also get this idea of language implicitly reinforcing these ways of thinking um, that aren't necessarily helpful to the causes that we, um, that, that we might be championing now. They're just kind of taking, we might be taking two steps forward and then, and then kind of implicitly taking one step backwards every time we try and think about things in these, these um, historically blinkered ways. Um, so there's the, the way in which it kind of, language can obscure things, but it can also reinforce some of the, the, the kind of negative ways of thinking that we're trying to move away from. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm just coming off the back of just that final comment. I think Paul Gilroy in his work uh, talks about the way in which raceology kind of keeps slipping back into the kind of conversation, even though we might try to create new categories, try to disarm, um, you know, uh, so, you know, BAME became, becomes a kind of a racialized category, although I'm not quite sure what BAME is. Uh, they kind of mythologize. So the danger is that categories can start to build myths, okay? Uh, and so maybe we, we should use them, have a very short shelf life categories, even if we think that they should be, they might be useful in certain contexts, yeah, in certain situations. Actually, if you, if you go to France, and, 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 and I think Germany as well, the government does not collect any data on ethnic differences. And they do that quite deliberately because they can refer back to race science and, 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 and eugenics and what happened in Nazi Germany the way in which categorization was used to determine who can live and who can die. And that wasn't just about uh, you know, Jewish people, it, it was about black people, it was about migrants, Africans, it was about disabled people as well. And I'll, I'll touch on some of that this afternoon. So off the back of that, they legislated that the state should not classify people into these categories. Now the counter argument to that is that then, then, the, then you kind of disguise hide racism. And there's plenty of racism in France, yeah? So you've got the kind of other extreme in the United States where I think in California at the last census there's something like nearly 280 categories. And what you find is it, it, it becomes a politics of identity. So groups are now using a category to legitimize their claims. And you'll find within groups then there'll be other groups and within, you know, so you know, you, there's an Indian category. But India is 1.3 billion people. And, and you know, have 30 odd states in India. So now the Gujaratis are saying, we shouldn't be classified as Indian, where Gujarati or Tamils or Punjabis. But where do you end? Because the Punjabis divide themselves into the Dwabis, and yeah, you, and I'm sure that you get into tribes. So, so it becomes absurd at one level. And that's why I think you need to see that these, these things are tools. They are not about human beings as such. Uh, and as long as we can hold on to that, that's fine. And the intersectional stuff is really important because, you know, one category might uh, shine light on something, but it might also create darkness on something else. So it's a complex field. I mean, I'm not sure there's an easy solution there. I don't even know what my category is. And, and, and was it uh, um, Stuart Hall? He said that our identities are about roots and roots. R double O T S and R-O-U-T-E-S. It's about 
where you come from, but where you're going. And I don't know where I'm going. So I don't know where my category is going to go. And I think that links to what Divine was saying about actually being different in different spaces as well. Mm. And I think that takes us quite nicely into sort of language and, and categories differing over time and, and space and having a history to them. And it takes us into a question actually that we had prior to the session. And having said I'll pick it up right, and I've singularly fa uh, failed to write it down. So are you able to read that out for us, please? two-part question. Um, the first is, to what extent does the recent history of our language limit or enhance the development of new words when it comes to discussing diversity, particular, particularly around education systems? And does the lack of history behind new language lower the power of its use in discussion? So new words and terminology which don't have history behind them, how does that impact again on what you were just saying? It's, it, that's a really complex question, and to try to answer that, to do justice, it, it, we probably need an hour at least. What I would say is, and, and I'm not saying this flippantly actually, the English language is, is a wonderful language. Let, let, yeah, I'm not saying that in some kind of imperial way, although it is imperial as well, because it seems to absorb so many words, and the Oxford English Dictionary just gets fatter and fatter and fatter. And so what we need to understand that the English language isn't about England. You know, Chaucer told us that. And Chaucer, I mean, most of the words came from the Anglo-Saxon, but there's so many other words, Sanskrit words, uh, from different languages. So maybe we should rename the English language, call it the language of the world or something like that. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and so, you know, words do have histories. I, I don't think any word doesn't have a history. You know, you, they don't, unless it's some kind of commercial uh, advertising where they just kind of brainwash you into something. And I think it's incumbent that we learn the histories of the words, because that also tells us how diverse we are as peoples and how, how much where that diversity is ongoing. It's kind of, it's, 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 it's organic, as it were, not a word language is organic. I, I mean, I, I don't know what was behind the question, but I'm thinking of some of the words that are used nowadays, often derogatively in, in the EDI debate. So words like snowflake, like woke, and, and how do we deal with it where, where I mean, maybe they do have a history that I'm just not aware of. <coughs> well, the history is uh, on this notion of being politically correct. One of the ironies of this charge of the left, of progressives being politically correct, it was the left that invented the term political correctness, and it was debates amongst left-wing people as to who was true to Marxism and who wasn't true to Marxism. So politically, oh, you're correct because you're true Marxist. So the right kind of, these games are happening all the time. These are language games and, and the, the, the you know, politics is about these language games. And as long as we understand that, then we're okay. I think the problem is when we start to believe what's in the Daily Mail or what's in the Express, I think. And that's where we come, you know, universities are really, we need to teach students to, those critical thinking skills to realize that there's something above the kind of tabloid. And people throwing words at, uh, against each other. Akira, Divine, anything you wanted to? I don't know that. I, I just agree. I don't think there's any word that has no history or context mm -hmm. behind it, even if the context comes from social media, because that's a big way in which I think we get new words and new mm -hmm. phrases. I mean, in the past 10 years, you can think of so many phrases or words that have come up because of social media activism, for example, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think also when we're talking about EGI or we're talking about activism, a lot of people feel like they can't be activists because, or they can't participate in conversations because they're too academic and that can be intimidating or they're too, I don't know, they feel too outside themselves. So sometimes I think some of those words can be good because they give people an in to, into the discussion. So like being woke, I mean, I know these days it's become a very, you have to be woke about everything, you have to know about climate change and all. But originally, it let a lot of young people talk about their uh, experiences in the world and advocate for them. Even like the hashtag Black Lives Matter has allowed a lot of people who otherwise might have felt too intimidated or not being able to access spaces where they can have the conversations, it's let them have them. So I think, um, Sometimes having new words or new phrases to describe things when they're good can really widen discussion.
discussions and let people talk about their experiences and advocate for things that they care about. Now the danger is when we get into um, this thing of, okay, so now who's more politically correct than the other? Or, or you can say this and... So that's where I think it can be a problem. But I think having new words is important because new, new words would mean more people can talk about things. Can I just say something about Shakespeare? We talk about words, yeah? Apparently Shakespeare used uh, over 30,000 words. He's seen as this person. And, and there weren't even 30,000 words to use. So what Shakespeare was doing is creating words. He would take two words and join them together and create a new word. And there's lots of examples of that. Great writers create words. Uh, and that's just, that's just how it is, you know, words are generative. And, and I, I like that sort of more positive um, perspective in terms of language being used positively to enable discussion, even when the, maybe the, the meaning and the emphasis behind the word is a, is a more negative one. But also, I mean, we haven't got any linguists on the panel, but really interesting thing to mind what you're saying about actually how maybe social media is speeding up the sort of um, uh, embedding, for example, of a word within a language or its currency more, more widely. Uh, Ryan, are there other questions that have come through from Twitter or in the debate that we need to pick up? And I'm looking at Catherine as well in terms of how much time we've got. I think, are we at time? Or? Okay. Okay. So, do you want to maybe just take, take one question? Is that okay? Sure. Um, so, another question revolves around um, with the rise of cancel culture, how do we ensure that members of the dominant culture feel encouraged to ask and understand quote unquote good and bad language of different cultures to help society become more inclusive. Okay. Um, Wei Lin, did you hear that question and are you happy to offer some reflections on that? Wei Lin, can you hear me? I don't think Wei Lin can hear us. Akira, could I maybe come to you on, on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, um, can, yeah, can, cancel con culture is, is, I mean, that, that's a whole other debate in and of itself, whether the people using the global pa platforms to complain about cancel culture have actually ever been cancelled. Um, but I think the key aspect to, to kind of understanding what is and isn't appropriate to say and to do is, is just to expose oneself to, um, to, to whatever space one is trying to, to behave sensitively in, in a position of um, where, where one is not the authority, where one is there to observe and to, to listen and, and, and just to take a back seat for the time being before you need to start kind of airing your own opinions about whether something is uh, is um, the the right thing to do from from the dominant cultural perspective. Um, I think that's one domain in which we see um, we see both kind of really good practice and, and awful practice uh, on social media. You, you can see um, social media affords people the space to just look, to, to, to take a back seat in the conversations, to be there and to, to understand. It's certainly, um, uh, it's certainly a way in which I've, I've learned, for example, about, about my own identities and how, how people speak about those um, who are used to speaking about those identities. I think you also see the, the, the really kind of negative, um, well, I, I, I see what you're saying, but I totally disagree, um, kind of coming to it from a position of authority where no authority is, um, is, is warranted. And so it, it, it's probably a, a lovely little sandbox in which to see all of the ways in which this can be done well and, and badly. But I, I think the most important thing is to, to park one's authority at the door and just to, to, to approach a, a space uh, with a view to, to kind of absorbing and, and, and learning. Thanks so much, thank you. I'm just going to come to Big Ryan because you've very much a, a sort of hot topic in student uh, networks at the moment in terms of cancel culture. Um, it is, and I think so. First of all, I think cancelling came from when well known people did things that people don't, that are not acceptable in the space we're in now. And so people would boycott their music or their art, and that's generally where 
cancel culture all came from. Uh, but I think there's, so the first part is, for example, 10 years ago, there are things that maybe people in the dominant culture would be allowed to do that are not okay, but because of how things were 10 years, even, yeah, even 10, 15 years ago, there are things that people could say on social media and do on social media, whether it was against women, whether it was like against whatever other category, there are things that were deemed as acceptable that are not acceptable anymore. So I think that's where the fear of a lot of people comes in, is are we allowed to say this anymore? Is it appropriate to do things? And there's a lot of fear created around that. But remaining open to learning is the main thing. I think that normally if you're asking a genuine question, people will receive it as a genuine question. I feel that a lot of the things that people have asked me that are like about racism, you can always tell you will the the person will make you feel a particular way and you can see when they're coming from a place of i am genuinely asking and i genuinely would like to learn and you can see when they're coming from a place of you know what i really want to do this and i think it's okay and i want you to kind of give me permission to say something or to do something so if people remain open to learning, and I think for people who identify as a minority of any sort, there's also, social media can be very polarizing. And so there's also this thing of everyone in the dominant culture is bad, all of them should be canceled, none of them should be. So there's also a lot of that going on. So for people who are minorities, I think it's, there's also an element of grace. So the system is created like this and we're all complicit in some way or the other to a particular system of oppression, whether that's because of the privilege you're offered, because of your class or your gender or your race. So there's also grace to give other people there and not being on the extreme, extreme other side and being like, all these people are bad, I won't interact with them, all of them are canceled immediately, they can't say anything. So I think that's the balance. On one side, remain open to learning, and on the other, give people the actual grace to learn. Just, just, just coming out from a different angle. Actually, the, the history of coloniality is the history of cancelling cultures, destroying cultures, er, er, you know, erasing cultures. Um, and it's really interesting that uh, when we talk about world music, and what's the opposite of world music? You know, we have music and world music, and that just shows you how. In, in some sense, world music is an, is an attempt to reclaim those cultures that have been cancelled, those traditions. So, so just one last point, Socrates was a victim of cancel culture. I mean, you know, he, was, he had to test the hemlock because people didn't, disagree, didn't agree with his, his methodology or his ideas. So, so we can't get out of this, yeah? Um, but what I would say is that a lot of the rhetoric around cancel culture is based on myth. Um, there was a research done, is that how many people had been cancelled, and they found that actually they couldn't find anybody that had been cancelled. Somebody had a grievance, they went to the, the, the gutter media, and then the gutter media takes something out of context and blows a big story up. Remember the Barbar Bar Black Sheep one about in some South London school that they were banned Barbar? Bar. Well, actually, it was completely taken out of context, and, and they made a story out of it. So I think a lot of the fears of cancel culture are just simply fears and nothing else, you know, I think that's, um, you know, that, that, that's the case. Although I would say that, uh, uh, you know, there was those conversations at UCL where the eugenic societies were still meeting, and whether there, is some, there are some things that we should say, actually, no, we will not legitimize this. If you think about Nazi Germany, one of the things that happened in post-war Nazi Germany is they said that denial of the Holocaust is, is, is a criminal offense, it still is. And, um, uh, and, and so is that cancel culture? Is that saying, well, people should be allowed to make both sides of the argument? So it's a complex, complicated issue. I feel I need three dots now here to say to be continued. There's so much more <laughs> conversation we could, we could still have, and I think so many more topics mm. to explore and to explore in more detail. But I'm, I'm afraid we do need to bring this, this session to, to a close. So let me, let me finish by, by thanking our panelists uh, Waylin for joining us, particularly for joining us from, from China, despite the, the big time difference. Uh, Akira O'Connor, 
D Divine Momasi and uh, Gurnam, Gurnam Singh. And, and thank you not just for coming along, but for your openness in, in sharing both your knowledge, where we've gone from Socrates to, to Shakespeare, but also sharing your experiences, because this is uh, um, something that impacts on us all as individuals, as well as in a, an academic debate and a conceptual debate as well. So thank you for your generosity of your time and your openness with your knowledge and experiences. Thank you, Catherine. going to tell us uh, what happens next. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're going to take a, a short break, around 10 to 15 minutes, if you'd like to step outside and have, uh, those of you who are here in person, if you'd like to step out and have a cup of coffee, some fruit, some pastries, we'll be back at... Uh, between 20 past 25 past with our next session, which is a in conversation, uh, Claudia Duval, chemical, in conversation with Matthew Rook, uh, with some performance. So we're all very excited about that. If you would please just make your way out into the foyer. Thank you. And if you're online, we will see you soon.
here. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> yes, I'm Matthew Rook. Uh, I'm honorary professor of music and theatre at St Andrews and also an alumni way back to the days of uh, 1982. So in those days, diversity was really about the issue of spotting what different coloured corduroy trousers uh, people had. Uh, but it's great to see this initiative um, because you're know, hearing that 122 connections uh, and the notion that we know the world's a small place. We know it's getting smaller. And the opportunity for St Andrews to maintain those relationships across the world and across those countries is something to celebrate and to develop. But that's me. Crucial question of today is, who is Claudia Lubau? Uh, rapper, ha academic, normally things which don't normally, you think, go together. And I think it's a very exciting uh, time to see ways in which people are using new ways of communicating, new ways of talking about themselves and their work and their communities to create something which could be of value to everybody. So who, who are you? <laughs> uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Claudia Lubao and first of all I would like to say thank you Matthew for doing this with me. Uh, Claudia Lubao is also known as Chemical and Chemical, this is a Tanzanian musician uh, and currently I'm pursuing a PhD, a practice-based PhD. Uh, so my PhD is an interdisciplinary one. It's between the music center, I mean between music, uh, earth environmental sciences, but also the uh, geography and development. So yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, but what I'm trying to do, uh, the thing I'm trying to do here is communicating um, cultural heritage through music because what we believe is that, I mean with academics, we, be, we, we have been using um, different methods to make sure that um, our findings are getting there, right? Are getting to the public. And we have been using things like uh, presentations, conferences, like what, I, what we are doing here today, uh, publications and all that. But now the question is, does uh, these findings really go out to the public or they keep on circulating around, you know, amongst ourselves? I will publish a paper and I'll, I, I'll circulate it to the, to my, you know, to my emails, <laughs> the same, same emails that we keep on sending things, right? Uh, and even the presentations, uh, they're only accessible to the, you know, if you're affiliated with those people. So, uh, but as a researcher, my greatest thing, I mean, my greatest, uh, I mean, the thing that I would really want is for my research or for my findings to go out there to the public. Because while we were doing research, while we were on, out, outside on the field work, we were talking to the people. But when it comes to, to the result now, they do not get that. So um, what I'm doing here is trying to use uh, other vigorous ways to communicate heritage, to communicate our values through music. And because I'm a musician, at first, I mean, I do mainstream music, music right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a popular musician back home. Um, I do this music, which, which is called Bongo Flava. It's very popular. But I was like, OK, since I'm in academics, why can't I use the same music that I use, uh, which had made me famous back home, like to communicate now studies, to communicate, uh, you know, to communicate heritage? And yeah, that's what I'm here today, to show you the intersection between music and uh, academics and how we can use more entertaining ways. I'm sorry, it's not like what we're doing right now, it's not entertaining, but I think we can do better to make sure that whatever we're doing is going out there. So I've been producing songs, which um, uh, different songs about cultural heritage, Africans' cultural heritage, and yeah, I've been working with different people to make sure that, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned bongo flavor. Yeah. Have you got a chance to give us a flavor of what bongo flavor is like? Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can show you one of the bongo flavors. Sorry, 
Jonathan, can we play the climate and heritage song? Yeah. So it's all going to be musical in here today, so, you know. <laughs> so uh, I mean the song which is going to... Uh, thank you Jonathan so you can more watch more from my YouTube uh, channel it's chemical official but uh, what you hear right now that is bongo flavor. When I say bongo flavor, this is the Tanzanian music genre. It uses Swahili. I'm sorry that you're not understanding anything that I'm seeing in there, but there are subtitles. So uh, it uses Swahili, and it's very popular back home, like especially to youth. Everyone is listening to that kind of music. So when you use it, when you apply it to talk about other stuff, it's easier for younger generation, I mean, to, 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 to pay attention and to focus. So that's the reason. Uh, people would be like, okay, why don't you use English? You know, it's more global, but... I'm a cultural person, so I mean that's one way of preserving cultural, yeah. like uh, using the same language, but trying to see, uh, try to find other models of making it uh, transmit to other people, like having subtitles. And maybe we are thinking next release, maybe we can also have uh, signs in our videos, just to make sure that the message is going out there. Yeah. And I think one of the things, certainly when I look at the world, is that it is often the people who live closest to the cultural artifacts and heritage are the ones who can often be overlooked. And they've yeah. got that sense of ownership and responsibility and yeah. care for it. So if you look to the history, say, in, in Zimbabwe, where there was that belief, oh, these Africans couldn't have built these buildings. Yeah. No, this wasn't possible. So that uh, means of connecting with people, is that the reason why you use something that they will identify as their culture and you're using that to uh, have a conversation with them where they might not be immediately thinking, they get up in the morning, I'm just going to see what the latest academic paper is yeah, uh, yeah, about yeah, this subject. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, because with what I'm doing, I'm trying to, you know, if you're a musician, I mean, if you're this person uh, on a spotlight, people will see you like, okay, you are this person that maybe you, you cannot get that enough time to mm -hmm. be close to people. But with what I'm doing now, I try to make sure that uh, even with my researchers, I mean, every song that I've produced here, I've gone back to the roots, like producing them. We've been there like researching uh, and doing everything to make sure that uh, the people there, themselves, they feel like they're part of it. They do not see me as you know someone who is popular or what, but they see me as that person who is advocating their cultural heritage. Yeah. And the process, do, are you aware of anyone else who is using music and song uh, in relation to cultural heritage in this way? Uh, okay, that one is tricky because, uh, I mean, with musicians, I mean, everything is about money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about uh, producing your songs out there and uh, getting gigs and you know, singing things which are entertaining. It's, it's, I mean, music is broad. You can sing about everything. But for this, I mean, what I'm doing, um, no, I haven't seen anyone doing it. So that's the reason even when I began doing it, people thought I was crazy. I mean, my fellow musicians, uh, people who knew like, okay, what are you going to get out of this? Why are you doing it? It, it felt like I'm either wasting my time because they still believe that you cannot actually have a gig where you can perform these kind of songs. And I kept on doing it, and it has nurtured me in a very different way, in a way that now I can, um, I can intersect Claudia, I can intersect Chemical the Musician, and I still have the same, same fans who are using, I mean, who are listening to my mainstream music and to the cultural heritage music type. Yeah. And this, this, this process, you, you call it musicalizing. Musicalizing, yeah. Yeah, could you tell us more about how you see that? Uh, so, uh, as I say, musicalizing this is uh, is the way where you use music to communicate things, uh, anything. And the reason maybe people might be asking, okay, why are you using music? Music, you know, uh, music is a powerful uh, memory tool. Yeah, it's a powerful memory tool. I ho I hope we all believe that. And I mean. Uh, 
it's not me saying it's not me saying that it's a powerful memo tool, but it's because of the even the findings that have been done. I mean, uh, people have been doing uh, psycho psych I mean, uh, psychologists, neuroscientists have been doing res uh, researches on how human process. I mean, music process text or speech when they are, you know. That they're, they're being uh, communicated through music. So it, it, uh, the research shows that people are, are able to remember things which are used to, which are communicated through music rather than just text or words. So for me, that is an, an, an advantage. But music is also uh, used in habitual, okay, habitual repetition and uh, memorization. So it also uh, helps in enhancing learning. I'll give you an example, and I want you all to participate in this, right? Um, you know, I believe all of us in here still remember songs that we used to sing in kinder kindergarten levels, right? I have one. Eddie Shod, how do you sing it? I need you to sing it. The head and shoulder, you know, when you, you know. Oh, yeah. How do you sing it? Back home, we, we, use, we use the same, same, I mean, we use the same melody for every song uh, when it comes to this song. So the Eddie Shod, how do you sing it? But you say, uh-huh. Right. <laughs> Knees and toes. I have another one. A, B, C, D. E, F, G. Uh huh. It's all. It's all. It's all musical. A for apple. B for ball. It's all musical. So now in in, in my head, I'm like, okay, what if uh, maybe our causes were in music? What if we were singing our publications? What if we were singing our thesis? What if we were, you know, we were singing biology, chemistry, medicine, and all that? What if? Because if imagine if you can still remember a song from when you were in, uh, a kindergarten, you know, student, and you can still remember it right now. I I I think learning would have been you know, more exciting. <laughs> it would have been nice, yeah. So that's uh, for me, but also um, music is part of a human nature. We all, in one way or another, we all have like uh, came close to music. We have either listened to it, participated in it, and uh, this makes it a human behavior. I mean, everyone can, everyone is musical. Y you like it or not, but I still believe that everyone is musical, whether the way you respond to it, the way you listen to it and all that. So uh, the musicalizing thing, it all falls uh, on this background of the power of music that it has, you know, to people. So that's why we use music. And I'm, I am using this in uh, archaeology and heritage, but it can also be applied in many ways. We can use it, as I said, we can use it in medicine, we can use it in everywhere. You can sing whatever you want to sing. Actually, I want people to come to me now. If you want to sing your dissertations, I'm going to sing them. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that, that's the thing, because it's, it's very powerful compared to other things, it's very powerful to a way that I still think messages which are going to be delivered through music can be uh, well enhanced. Mm -hmm. mm. And could you talk about maybe some of the impacts that you've seen of the work that you've done in either changing people's perceptions or their thoughts or their actions in Tanzania? Yeah, yeah. So, um, the first song that I did, I mean the first song that we did, so, so this, uh, the musicalizing thing, uh, is a work, is a joint work. I'm, you know, I'm here in front of you as a, you know, as a, as a musician, but uh, on the background there are people who are also part of this huge thing. And I'll talk about, uh, for instance, Dr. Ligdu Sichumbak, who is uh, from the University of Dar es Salaam. So me and Dr. Ligdu Sichumbak, we met in 2017, and we released the first song. We began doing the musicalizing thing and released the so first song, which is called Kilo Ayeto. So the Kilo Ayeto song, uh, maybe if you have time, we can we, we can play that. Uh, yeah. So the Kilo Ayeto song was released in 2019, and now the reason of releasing the Kilo Ayeto song, my colleague Dr. Ligdu Sichumbak and and Dr. Mapunda, his colleague, they wrote a paper on this heritage world site. I mean, on the World Heritage Site, which was endangered and it needed like uh, urgent intervention. So they wrote a paper, as academics do, right? So they wrote a paper and. After writing this paper, they circulated the paper, Dr. Ichumba circulated the paper to government officials because the site was, it really needed urgent intervention. So uh, he distributed the, the paper 
to government officials, but also UNESCO officials, because we still believe uh, like um, challenges which are facing a certain world heritage site can be the same. So it also it also distributed it to government officials, and they never responded. None of them responded anything. And so we were like, okay, we are going to take the same same paper, and trans I mean to transmit it into music. The same paper was transmitted into music, and that's where we, I mean, we released a song called Kulayeto. And now, um, the amazing song, I mean, the amazing thing now after this song, after the Kulayeto uh, was released, we did the same, same thing of circulating that song, and this time around, people came out. People responded like, okay, this is what's going on in Kilwa? Yeah, and we were, we were lucky that uh, UNESCO loved it uh, a lot and they even recommended us like um, to do another song now on African's heritage site because the first one was specific to uh, this certain heritage site. So yeah, but apart from just getting that attention from the officials, the government and everyone, uh, in Kilwa right now, when, uh, I was there in the summer and things were very, were very different, like, uh, uh, you know, comparing to like the past four years when we recorded the song. I mean, the, the place, the, they've started like managing the place, but also when talking to people, you can see how they, they are proud of what is being, I mean, the, the Kilwa Yet song in Kilwa is the nation, I mean, for them, it's still the, the anthem. After four years, they will tell you that we, this song is, it's communicate about heritage. And I was able also to speak to this woman, uh, she's a disabled. Uh, she cannot, she cannot walk, but she lives very close to the, she lives, I mean, very close to the site, but it's because of uh, her disabilities, she have never visited the site, and it's with the song, she was like, you know, you could feel how she felt after singing the song, like, okay, this, this means a lot, because I've never seen the ruins, and it's through this song that I get to see the ruins and all that, so I think uh, the impacts have been great, a lot, and maybe if we play, um, yeah. So uh, if we play this video, this is just a compilation. <laughs> That's me. That is me performing in the one of international conferences. And that is the same same me now performing in a local region. So these impacts are not just to internationals, even the locals. And yeah, that's it, me. Uh, I was collecting perception, I mean, uh, views to the students. So yeah, now, now with the impacts, it's like uh, I had to go out there because we have seen great things happening, but we're like, okay, as a researcher, I need to go there and talk to people directly and see what they feel about the music. And you can see me uh, on the bus. That was the first time people seeing Chemical on the bus. They're like, are you Chemical? I'm like, I'm famous, you know, back home. So people wouldn't expect you to see, on, to see you on the, on the bus, right? And people are like, are you Chemical? I am. But when you start talking about their, their heritage, they'll forget if you're chemical and they'll give out their, their opinions and all that. So, uh, but it's because we, we recorded the first song. I mean, we, we released this first song in 2017 and up to date we have released like um, five songs and that means it's because of the impact we're getting and it's not just us. Uh, we have been working with different uh, institutions, UNESCO, British Council initiatives. I mean, British Council, uh, the, the rising from the depth, University of St. Andrews have been also supporting me in doing this and so many others. So it's because they see what's coming out. And previously, our previous project was on based uh, with the Tanzanian musician. But um, uh, I mean, the last song that we have released, uh, we have featured other musicians from the East Africa, like from uh, Kenya, from Uganda. And this is, you know, to combine our joint, I mean, to join together to make sure that we spread more so maybe i believe maybe next time we're going to feature scottish musicians or yeah 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 and on your life as an academic um because i'm looking at some of those images and you know people huge crowds yeah. and i think um 
it's a very different feel to say if you've gone to a, an academic you know, conference. I expect to see you know, hundreds of people waving, joining, and, 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 and being involved in that work. And I wonder, what impact has your life as a musician had on the way that you view your life as an academic? Th that is a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one because um, I struggled a lot like to separate the two, to separate chemical, because it, there was this one point when it felt like two person in one person. Like, you know, we have chemical, we have Claudia, we have this chemical who is established out there as a musician, as the best female rapper, I mean, as the one who won awards and all that. And we have this now, another person who is Claudia, and she's just an academic, you know? And she's trying so hard to be part of the academic thing, while we also have this another person who is trying to outshine, like, okay, I want to be seen as a, as a musician. So it was a tough one. I, I really tried hard to separate the two. I remember there was even this time when, with my social medias, I, I had like, um, you know, I had a, a specific social media for Chemical and one for Claudia. Like, okay, Twitter will be for Claudia. I'll just posting, I'll be posting things about academics and everything. Instagram and Facebook will be for Chemical. I'll be posting about my things, about my gigs and all that. But as I was growing into academics, uh, maybe without knowing, uh, you know, these two people became inseparable, Chemical and, uh, and Claudia became inseparable. And I'll give you uh, one example. There was this time I was, when I was in Kilo now, when, in the summer when I was in Tanzania, I went to Kilwa to this place uh, where I do my research. And I went to a club, to a nightclub, just to have fun. I, I wasn't there as Chemical, I wasn't there as Claudia. I went there as another different person to have fun. And people noticed, okay, Chemical is in the building and all that. We want her to come to the stage. Uh, so I had to do it because with the fans, if they want you, you need to go there. I had to go there. So because it's a nightclub, people are drinking, people are having fun, I just chose these songs which, in my head, I'm like, these are mainstream songs, are the songs that I should be singing. So I just performed those songs and I get off the stage and, you know, a group of people came to me later like, we are so disappointed on you. <laughs> I was like, why? Why are you disappointed? How can you not perform the Kilo Yet song? Imagine, in my head I was like, Today's night is not about cultural heritage. I would not perform a song about cultural heritage. It's not the right place. You know, but they were like, we're so disappointed. Why, why are you not performing our song? I was, you want me to go back there and perform the climate, I mean the, 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 the cultural heritage song about Kilo? That's our song. So they made me go back there to perform the Kilo Yet song, which is, is about the, you know, it's just about cultural heritage and people are vibing to it. And I was like, okay, so right now I'm, just, I'm not just Claudia. People also accept what I'm bringing to them, meaning they're learning. I mean, my, my aim is to raise awareness about those things, and it means that they are learning about those stuff. But also apart from that, uh, as a musician, I've been releasing songs, and in, uh, previously I would choose the way I would release songs, I would disseminate them, and... Uh, Exactly in the summer when I went back home. When I go back home, it's when I get to do many things. So when I go, I go back home, I release two tracks, and these tracks were not part of heritage. They were not part of anything. They're just showbiz songs, and so I released them as the way of entertaining my fans. But after before releasing them, I took a, a photo shoot. I mean, I made a photo shoot with Chemical uh, with two people. I mean, the one Chemical and you know the Chemical in a in a suit. This. The chemical that people know, in a sort. And the other chemical now was in a dressing gown. And I combined these uh, photos together and I started posting them. So people were like, okay, is she married? What's happening with chemical and all that? And I began getting so many uh, like hoes to do interviews. And when I decided to do interview, I was down. Uh, it was a way of promoting songs because, you know, with us, Musician, we want to. We, we always want to get stunts, attentions, and all that. But when I was releasing now this song, when I was giving interviews, I talked, and they asked, "Okay, why are you in a wedding gown?" And uh, my caption was in Tajio. And Tajio means I will marry myself. I'm a Swahili speaker, so Tajio means I will marry myself. Why would you want to marry yourself? And I start now talking about why do I want to marry myself? It's because I do not believe in marriage. So it was again a very crucial thing. Like, why don't you believe in marriage? I'm like, 
Because with marriage, uh, in, our, in our tradition, marriage uh, is something which is respectable, it's seen respectable. If you're a woman and you're not married, it seems like you're losing something. So for you to, to have that certain status back home, you need to be a female, you need to be married, you need to, you know. So were you taking maybe a, a, a risk? It was a big risk, it yeah. was a big risk. But uh, on, on top of that, I was like, okay, because we as females, we feel like uh, if we're not, for us to get something, we need to be in a certain st status. So the woman who is not married, people look her as someone who is not blessed, someone who is not lucky, someone who is not respected, you know. And to me, I was like, if you're just a woman and you believe in yourself, you are, you are okay. And it's because of that that People in marriage, I mean, uh, my friends, I have my friends who there was a certain time they were frustrated because they have turned to this age and they are still not married. So it even make those who are in marriage to like accept whatever comes to them, violation. They are brutal treated just to make sure that they do not get out of it. And I was, it was just a conversation which came out because of my photo shoot, but the songs were not related to them. And because of that, they began having this, you know, uh, uh, sensitive topic about marriage, about violation. And to me, I was like, okay, it's good because we are still, even though I'm still uh, releasing other songs, but it also at attached to, to, I mean, to what I'm doing. If I was just chemical, I wouldn't brought that topic maybe. But I've also had a chance, I mean, I've also had, had an opportunity to release, to, to, I mean, to shoot a video, to film a f my very first video in the UK. And it was done by Olivia. Say hi, she's right in there. Uh, so uh, we did this, uh, I mean, video. It, it hasn't been released yet, but we did this video. And if I was chemical, maybe it's, it's my first time in the UK. Maybe I would, you know, use the urban settings, the buildings, the luxury cars. That's what musicians do when they're outside their country. But for me, this video is all about maritime heritage. I've just filmed it in the, um, the East Coast and you will just see the, the maritime, the Orkney, you would, in Orkney also, you just see the, you know, the archeological sites and all that. So it's just within in me. So that's where I've managed to intersect, to, to intersect Claudia and Chemical, yeah. And so, uh, sorry, uh, can you play that video with the, the risk, sorry. I mean, yeah, that one, that one. So that we were in the studio session, and that is me performing uh, at the nightclub, performing the Kilwayet song, which was a surprise to me. And that's that's the photo I told you about, and that's the song. Uh, Yeah, so the, the other thing that I'm great of, it's uh, I've managed also to connect, group, I mean, two group, different groups together, like the academics and the musicians. The f I mean, the clip you saw, the first, very few seconds, the first seconds, uh, you can see as in a studio session, we are recording, but in there, they are academics, you know, and musicians. They're all in a studio making something together, which, yeah, yep. I think, yeah. Yeah, so it's really, I mean, when, when you, Look at that, the applicability of that yeah. uh, in other areas. It's, it's probably nowhere, I mean, I was joking about the fact that you know, Dr. Dre um, is going to be you know, an academic in the way that you are, but there's clearly tools that people can use just to open things up and, yeah. and looking again at learning. I, I know in relation to the challenges with the climate, yeah. um, some of the biggest barriers from an academic perspective are getting beyond the community that's discussing this and how you can engage with a wide range of people, particularly when for many people it's something which could be so depressing that they don't engage with it. So I can see this approach that you've got being applicable uh, in, in many places. And I was just looking ahead now to the, the future, because I won't get the chance for people to hear you yeah. perform, and thinking, so what, what's the next five, ten years going to look like? What are we going to see you doing? So uh, in the next five, maybe 10 years, I see uh, the musicalizing thing going uh, broad. Mm -hmm. 
because we are doing this in Tanzania, but maybe uh, in the near future to come, I still believe this model can be applied in academics. My, I mean, my, my thing is to see that academics, I believe everyone here has a talent, but when we come to academics, we try so hard to hide our talents. But I still think we can use whatever we have, the talents that we have, to co I mean, to connect them together with academics. And this is the model that I'm trying to shape here, like musicalizing heritage. I'm musicalizing it in Tanzania, but it can also be done in Scotland. It can also be done in America. It can also be done anywhere else. And we can musicalize biology. We can musicalize medicine, engineering, and everything. So uh, yeah, so I'm calling out to everyone, anyone who is interested. Uh, and this is not just music, anything that you feel. I'm a musician, so today I'm advocating about music. So, but this can be uh, even dancing your PhD. It, it, it can, uh, you know, it can be anything. It can be poetry, it can be whatever that um, uh, you think that you can push it out there and people uh, being entertained, but at the same time learning. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what excites me about this is that in, in the university sector, we genuinely, and, and in, uh, importantly, concerned about access. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, the tools that you're using might open up avenues of access to people to engage um, with education and learning yeah, in a way yeah, that exactly. existing techniques don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think let's, yeah. let's hear let's hear some of yeah. your, your music. Yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you so much. And before we hear this, I would like to, the last slide, please, uh, just for acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge everyone who was, uh, we have been, as I said, this is a joint uh, thing. And I would like to thank, to thank Dr. Ichumbak because we have been doing this uh, together with him. It has been a, you know, a, a bumpy ride uh, journey. Um, but also uh, we have my supervisors. Thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Bede, uh, Dr. Richard Bates, I mean, Professor Richard Bates, who's not here right now, but I mean, he would, he would really want to be here, but also Nina Rao. And yeah, San Andrews Fusion, we're going to see them too, I mean, today, but also the Alicat. Thank you so much to the Alicat that are going to support me to the last thing that I'm going to show you, my talent now. And Matthew, but also Catherine and everyone who has, uh, has organized this. And those you see over there, there are some of the institutions that we have been working with, the University of San Andrews, British Council, uh, Lising from the Death, University of uh, Dar es Salaam, but also the Urithiwet, which is the team that we've been, uh, uh, I mean, working together in researchers and everything, the GCLIF and everyone. And thank you so much for coming. Now we're going to, uh, sorry for every, I mean, you're, you're tired of listening to me, but, you know, five well, more thank minutes. <laughs> thank you, Claudia. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So yeah, uh, you know, I told you I'm a, uh, I am a musician. So even my interest was supposed to be to be musical. It's just too sad it wasn't. Uh, but we're going to end up with a performance. And this is a song called Climate and Heritage. The song is about climate. And climate, it's a, climate change, I mean, it's a, a global thing. It's something which is facing us worldwide. And as academics who are doing uh, the musicalizing thing, we thought it would be uh, good to communicate these things. We have been having the COP26, COP27, people everywhere discussing about climate. But we thought maybe we could also use music to communicate these things. So. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, the song is in Swahili, <laughs> but uh, I believe with the with, with what with the posters that they are relics for everyone, so they can uh, the, the relics are in English, so you can if you have a time you can just check them. But even the song on YouTube uh, it has a Swahili sub I mean the English subtitle where you can understand. But 
I'm sorry I'm going to have to teach you Swahili today. Time. 
climate change is the greatest east uh, facing us all. Uh, enjoy British Council initiatives, unite, work together, tackle climate heritage impact, transform our past, preserve our future. Enjoy, guys. The climate. take this uh, opportunity to, to appreciate, uh, uh, you know, this is the different music. It's, it was very different uh, from what uh, the, the, the Tan and Roots Fusion are used to, the Alicat are used to. They have sung some Swahili words, and please, a round of, of applause to them. And I still believe uh, it was a hassle for the band, because we were trying to get that African sound. I was like, let's please, guys, I need that sound. So for me, I think this is the, is the beginning of uh, great collaborations. And thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Jonathan, up at the top there. So thank you very much, and thank you, Claudia, for the excellent performance, and to Matthew for your very skillful interview. Thank you. Thank you also to our panel for a thought-provoking um, discussion this morning, and to you, our audience, here in person, but also online, and thank you so much for supporting us today. Please join us for lunch in the foyer. Um, those of you who are staying with us, we will reconvene at one o'clock for our keynote, uh, keynote talk from Dr. Gunnar Singh. And you can also join us a bit later online to hear from alumna Jocelyn Pridgen. So thank you all. See you at lunch.